that um, makes Sherlock Holmes who he is. He mentions at the beginning, right? He uses the power of deduction. Yeah? The, and uh, deduction is a form of inference. Um, but there is uh, there's a bunch of group of people that would argue that yeah. what, um, Sherlock Holmes actually yeah. does is yeah. not yeah. necessarily deduction. Right. So let's remind ourselves, anybody knows what deduction is? The definition of deduction. I don't know about a definition, but it would be where a conclusion follows uh, irrevocably from some premises. Exactly. So, exactly. so you start from a, a bunch of facts, and then you use other facts to state whether a, a, to figure out whether a statement is true or false. Right? Uh, in more formal terms, uh, it's the, a deduction is the, uh, um, is the process of starting from axioms. Axioms are statements are self-evident. And then using rules and theorems of the logic to prove new theorems, okay? Now, there is another form of inference. Um, do we know what this other form of inference is? <laughs> what's what's the other? <laughs> so that, the second one is induction. What's, so what's the difference? What's, what's induction? Now when we see what the Sherlock Holmes was actually doing induction or called deduction. It's the other way around. No. So maybe the conclusion probably be the result of the premises. So the idea is in, in this in induction you actually start from observations and then you um, based on this observation you try to infer to, to extrapolate what the next observation will be. Okay? And so so you try to extrapolate the unobserved facts. Okay? So that, that, that group of people that would argue that what's most of the time um, Sherlock Holmes is doing is not deduction, but induction, because most of the stuff that he comes across is unobserved events. Um, but uh, my purpose is to um, explore a little bit um, induction. And why, why would induction be, um, actually, if we go back a little bit, deduction, in terms of what we're interested in software and artificial intelligence, deduction is quite a little bit easy because it's, it's essentially, uh, which is explained in the formal settings, it's essentially starting from axiom and just applying rules to prove the false the truthfulness of the statement. And in fact, we have programming languages like Prolog that do exactly that. They, 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 um, so they're very good at that. So and that was like the basis of the old style AI. And so uh, that's why I say it's easy, induction is easy. Induction is not that easy. But why would we want to uh, be good at induction? 
it's there. So you can't use stuff from facts and transactions. And then all those facts, stuff that you know are facts and rules, to apply to the axioms to get other statements that may or may not be true. Induction, conversely or not conversely, differently, is to get you some observation, and based on this observation, you extrapolate to find out about the unobserved. Perfect. So it's a prediction. Thank you. Perfect. That's perfect. Why would induction? Why would we start to study induction? Prediction. So uh, artificial intelligence, all the stuff that we do has to do with classifying things, predict time series. So I would say that something like induction, kind of holy grail of artificial intelligence. More, more obvious, it suggests that um, um, almost everything that we have any interest in at all is, um, is inductive rather than deductive. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Uh, that, that's what we do all the time. So we uh, we, we, we uh, predict, we try to predict the world that we're in, uh, all our senses, how we like to predict what comes next. It's induction is super important, but if we if we know how to deal with induction, then, then we, we, we have artificial intelligence, essentially. And so the holy grail, I mean, in terms of induction, we have loads of like, deep learning, for example, now. And, uh, but these are very, most of the time, are like a very specific solution for very specific problems. So the holy grail of induction would be if we had one algorithm that solved all the induction problems. So we start from a piece of philosophical approach of solving the problem of induction. So are you aware of um, some way of uh, solving of induction? I'm sure you've heard a lot of these. When you have an hypothesis, how do you pick the best hypothesis for your induction? So your induction step. The induction step is picking the best hypothesis that gives you the best induction. And you've probably heard of at least one of them. Okay, open raise the stakes. In the face of um, you know, multiple hypotheses that uh, are consistent with what you see, you always the, the, the one that is most likely to be correct is the simplest one, the one that makes the least assumptions, least number of us. Okay, so that's one, philosophically speaking, that's one approach to uh, induction step. Then there was like the um, a different one, the uh, Epicurus, uh, the great Greeks um, philosophers, who uh, coined the, the principle of the principle of multiple explanations. That you have a bunch of hypotheses that are all consistent with the data, take them all, right? Kind of different from from Occam Razors. Okay, and then we have something that is not so philosophical, it, uh, it's, it's practical, but there's. Uh, uh, something about it that is, uh, is still um, contentious philosophically and practically, which is uh, Bayes' theorem. Have you, have you heard of Bayes' theorem? So Bayes' theorem is uh, something to do with, yes. <coughs> yes, with um, conditional probability. So the idea that uh, so the probability of your hypothesis being correct given the data that you see is equal to the probability of the data being generated by your hypothesis times the probability of, uh, actually we call it the prior probability, we'll discuss this, divided by the probability of the data I was generated. And we'll expand on this. So what this is, this is called the prior. This is the probability of your um, hypothesis. Uh, and it's interpreted as the belief that you have, you know, how confident you have, you are that this particular hypothesis is good. How good is this hypothesis, right? And the contention is, as opposed to the, um, the other approach to probability, which is the frequencies. Frequencies are just count. You need to be able to count things in order to calculate probabilities. This is different because they introduce a belief. So you start with some knowledge, and any knowledge you may have contributes to knowing how good your hypothesis is. And so they, you encode it in this. But the frequencies would say that in things that you never observed before, well, how the hell can you, what, what, what's your initial belief on this hypothesis if you haven't never seen the data, right? And so this is very contentious, and when you, up, you, know, when you use um, base, uh, uh, the base theorem to do uh, inference normally, uh, this is, uh, it's enough, 
put this up. And it's, uh, the first thing that people have to do is actually justify this. And most of the paper will be about justifying this. Okay. So we have three ways to approach induction. And then here comes uh, Ray Solomonov, 1960s. He said, okay, so how would I approach this? How can I, how can I come up with one algorithm that solves all my induction tasks? And he came up with something that actually encompasses all of the three uh, philosophical uh, uh, approaches. Although you know, they're philosophical, they're very nice and very sensible, but they're not very, they're, they're all qualitative ways of doing this. Or Solomon wanted something quantitative, he wanted to compute something. Okay, so we start with, we, you need to know a little bit about, uh, you're familiar with Turing machines? Well, than average. Who's not familiar with Turing machines? Mm -hmm. You're not familiar with Turing machines. Okay. Well, Machine. I'm a career based on the whole business. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're using one right now, yes. <laughs> every day. A Turing machine is the, the simplest, most abs abstract, or the simplest abstraction of computation. So as a matter of fact, this is the, the definition of computation, an operational definition of computation and computers. And the idea being, a Turing machine is a box uh, that has a long tape, okay? And this long tape is made up of characters, which are, as you have, usually let's just make it simple as just ones and zeros, okay? And you form your inputs. You know, your inputs to the, to, the, to the machine would be a bunch of ones and zeros. You have, your tape can have blanks, okay? Blanks then tell you to stop or, 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 or uh, you know, they usually use as markers and, and they're used to uh, output. So your, uh, through the machine, would you use the blank spots in the tape to put the output um, of the computation. Uh, and so, yeah, you have a bunch of characters with input, and the Turing machine does something and will output all the numbers, and this will be the output of the Turing machine. And the Turing machine knows what to do because it has a head, which points to a particular cell, okay, that you're doing this. And then it's got a table here of, it's called the state table, which says, when you have the state S, okay, do this to the tape, and you get into state S1, okay? And so the, uh, for example, the head would be here, C is at zero, so you go to the table and say, okay, if I, if I have a zero and I'm in the state, what do I do next? Move to the left and write a uh, zero, something like that, right? And you can encode any computation uh, into this. Uh, you encode your input as ones and zeros, you encode your table of, uh, of state transitions, and then you let the, the Turing machine go. And now then, there's, uh, we, we, he also discussed last time, the idea of a universal Turing machine. So well, how is a universal Turing machine different from a normal Turing machine? I was going to say, is it a Turing machine if it's made by a Turing machine? It simulates other Turing machines, yeah. yeah. Universal Turing machine is our computer. You can run any, you can compute any computable functions with our computer. So a normal Turing machine would just encode two plus two or a specific function. Whereas a universal Turing machine can run any any computation, any it can simulate any Turing machine. So how does it do it? It just so the rules that come in also affect the lookup table. It has to do with the lookup table. You're all absolutely right. What happens to the lookup table though? The, the, the transition table is actually encoded to become part of the input, right? So the, the, the part of the input won't just be the input to 2 plus 2, say, for example, but will also be the table itself encoded. And so the universal tree machine will decode the, um, the program in its input and so build the, uh, the table from the encoding that comes as an input and then take the rest of the input and run, run it on the program. Okay, so this, this basically, this part disappears. That's what happens. This disappears and it's just the encoded the program is part of the input. Okay. Am I so, a universal Turing machine? Sorry? Am I a UTF, a universal Turing machine? 
So what? How could you? How could you? How could so you answer that question? Going back into the next. How would you go about answering, answering this question? Well, I gave you the definition of human shield, so yeah. And and I'll tell you also that uh, one of the, the biggest, um, the, the greatest uh, um, the results from the theory of computation, which is surprisingly still back from the 30s when this, uh, this theory uh, came out, is that any model of effect effective computation is equivalent to a Turing machine or to a lambda calculus. So anything that uh, computes something, you, you can somehow turn, it's equivalent to this, which means that you can map this to any other model that is um, um, uh, then called computability, and that's what he said last time. If you remember, when he was talking about the game of life, someone will prove the game of life is too incomplete, complete. and which means they go from mapping how this works into how how is the tape represented by a life um, uh, automata? How is the table? Uh, encoded in the so you could go about it the same exact way. You would try to map the components of the Turing machines <laughs> to you. Now, ironically, or not so ironically, Turing machine Turing himself he, he developed this via introspection. He noted how he would compute, right? So he said, I would take a piece of paper and uh, and and. and um, and pencil, and then you know, how we know in my head how to do certain calculations, and I would write down the results. And it's essentially what he did through introspection. They just uh, abstracted all this introspection, how he did things to come up with this, essentially. Okay, so that, now that we know what a Turing machine is, we can discuss how Solomonoff um, was thinking about the idea of uh, Occam razors. Uh, which means if you have an hypothesis, uh, you pick the simplest one. So he was thinking of ways to uh, have a way to give more weight to the hypotheses that were the simplest. Okay. And so how this? What's the simplest? What's the simplest hypothesis? Uh, so ima he, he imagined this. He said, okay, imagine I have a universal Turing machine. Okay. That and I pass to this input uh, to this Turing machine just random bits. That is. I flip a coin and the coin says if its tail is a zero, if its head is a one. Okay? And I keep flipping. Okay? Um, and this forms the input to the universal tuning machine. Okay, so this is the program, as we said, the universal tuning machine encodes the program, right? And so this is not really a program, it's just a random stream of bits. Okay? And suppose our program was. Uh, we were trying to uh, do our induction, so we have a string with a character x1, x2, x3, x4, xn, right? So this is, this is just a, a binary string with the first position, the second position, end position of the binary string, right? And our induction was basically looking at this string and maybe perhaps try to predict what would be the next in this string. So that would be uh, an induction task that we're looking after. So it's time to consider, okay, imagine I have a universal tuning machine and I just input ones and zero at random, okay, and let me consider the ones that whenever I input these random string numbers, the output is my string x1, x2, x3, x4, x right? And, and so he thought, let's take all these things, right? All of the possible ways in which I can have this string with zero and the output of the universal tree machine is the string I'm looking after. And then he, th he thought about this. Okay, so what's the probability of any of these inputs, given that they're random, right? The probability of one bit is what? If you, if you toss a coin, what's the probability of getting a one or a zero? <coughs> one half, right? right? And so, suppose that was the probability of getting a one. So what would be the probability of getting a one followed by a zero? Someone else? Yes. Yeah. And so it would be 
one half for the first one okay. and another half for the second one, right? So you multiply the two probabilities. So you can see if I keep going, say suppose yes, and keep going, it will be time one half, time one half, right? And so we, we can just simplify and just write the probability of any string here will be one half to the power of the length of that string. Okay? Cool. And, uh, and you know, mathematicians, they like to write it so like this. When it's one over two, you can write it like two to the minus. the length of the input. We could call the input the program. Okay? So this would be the probability of any of these strings. And, and these strings could be um, exactly those programs that give us these outputs. Now you can see that the nice thing about this is that probably you see it better when it's like this. Length of P. So if P, if the length of P is very big, what happens to this number? As opposed to if the length of P was really small. So this is equivalent to saying one over two to the power of a large number, as opposed to one over two with a smaller number, to the power of a smaller number. When? As this get larger, right? Cool. So you can s s right away see kind of like uh, the hint of a Occam's razor here. This <coughs> probability, okay, is larger if the length of the program is smaller. Right? As this is exactly Occam's razor. Occam's razor said if uh, this program was your hypothesis, right? You want the hypothesis that has that's the simplest, right? And and uh, Solomon has decided, okay, so the simplest would be the shortest program, right? So I always want to pick the shortest program. And so how do I pick it? By looking at this, right? If I look at the probability of that, of that program, uh, I always give more weight to the program that has the smallest length. So you can have that same so is, is, is this making sense? Okay. And the second bit was pretty easy. He's, he thought, okay, so let's remind ourselves of Epicurus as well. Epicurus said, if you have a bunch of hypotheses that are all consistent with the data, take them all. And so this is exactly what Solomon did. And he created the uh, uh, universal a priori probability M. Okay? Um, M of X. X being what we're looking for, which is the sum, okay, across all the programs, okay, such that the universal Turing machine <coughs> outputs X, okay? And it's basically the sum of all their probabilities. And it is the length of the program. Okay, so what did he do? Is just take, he takes all the programs, all the possible programs that output this. He takes their probability, which is this, okay, to the length of the, of the program, and just sums them. So this means that the probability of uh, um, getting this guy is the probability of this program, or this other program, or this other program, all the possible programs that can generate um, X as an output. But this is like super nice. So in a fell soup, he um, combined Occam razors and uh, um, Epicurus by giving more weight to the solutions to the hypothesis that are the simplest, and then taking all of them that are relevant. Awesome. And so what is the major result? So that's, that's, that's not the major result, right? Because how useful is this? So you may 
or may not remember the definition of conditional probability. You wanted to know that what's the probability of a zero coming after? So when I do this, this is a, this is my string having seen t characters on my string. Yeah. So this is the first t characters on my string. So what is the probability of getting a zero? after having seen my uh, first t characters. And the definition, this is from probability, is the joint probability of seeing the character, the first character and the second characters and the third character after the t character, divided all the possible strings that start in t. This is just definition. Uh, but this shows that uh, we, if we, if if this was the real probability of, of, of what was happening, okay, we would have a very nice induction step. We can predict the next character, okay, by doing this calculation. If we knew, we knew, right? So this is this is this must be a great induction step. If we have some way to knew to know this, okay, if we knew the real, if we knew the real probability distribution, our we, we could make perfect predictions, and so. The great result of Solomonov, he showed that I'm going to write a formula and then explain it to you. And I, I hope it makes sense. So let me just write this is not small. Uh, The part to focus on is uh, this, square difference. You know what the square difference is? It's usually used to uh, calculate distance between two points or how close, how similar two points is, right? Uh, so the more similar two points are and you know, the closer to zero their square difference is. Correct? Right? So you say, you know, this, this is our real this is our real prediction if we knew the real probability distribution. And this is our prediction if we were using um, Solomonov way of doing this. Okay? Yeah. And so Solomonov showed that if you take, so this term here is actually an expectation. It's the expectation. What's, your, what's the expected value of this, this difference? How, how do you expect it? How much do you expect these to differ? Okay, um, so if you take this, this expectation across all the possible strings, okay, across all the possible length of these strings, okay, so you can see this is an infinite sum, what it showed is this, this is actually finite, okay? Um, funny enough, you guys remember Zeno's paradox? Do you want to explain the paradox? I think you can explain it better. In terms of the turtle? Yeah. Turtle and the hare, or turtle and the rabbit. Or... Rather than just the turtle, the turtle and the rabbit. Well, actually, the, the diff yeah, I mean, the usual thing is that uh, the turtle and Achilles. Achilles being the fastest person in Greece and the tortoise, right? So they decided to, uh, people decided to, they want to see a ring between the turtle and Achilles. And they know it's already unfair because the key is super fast and the tortoise is very slow. It's very slow. So what they decide to do is to give a tortoise like a, 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 a head, a distance ahead, a start far ahead, right? And the paradox is this, okay? So the race starts and uh, the, um, um, the, the tortoise goes and Achilles starts, okay? And Achilles uh, uh, goes like half away for a bit, right? And then, uh, Achilles uh, managed to go a uh, half away and then half away closer and then half away closer and half away closer than that still. And the paradox is, well, this is like an infinite sum such that, I mean, if it goes, it, ne it never catches up to the, uh, to the, uh, um, uh, to the, to the uh, tortoise because that's an infinite, uh, he has to cover an infinite um, series of smaller distances. And this actually, was solved. I mean, in practice, we know that's uh, stupid. 
it is a, this, 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 this a silly thing to consider. But this actually was never proved until very recently, uh, which is, is the same proof that helps you figure this, uh, that's in this. The idea is that when you have an infinite sum, there is actually, the result of which is actually finite, okay, that tells you, that, that proves that the difference between these two things eventually uh, converges to zero. Okay? And in, not only that, he showed that the finite, the finite result of this sum is actually uh, uh, converges super quickly, which means that if you were using this compared to any other possible way of, um, uh, of um, doing your induction, this would get you to the correct result, close to the, to the real distribution of the problem very, very quickly. Um, and what's also more interesting is that this, this is bound, bound meaning this is less than or equal uh, of this, 2 to the minus k of x. So this is um, Kolmogorov complexity. I, I think you were waiting for that. Uh, Kolmogorov complexity as being, uh, it's uh, one of the uh, most interesting measure of uh, how a complexity of an object, how complex an object is. Um, and it's the same idea. The complexity of an object is uh, the length, essentially the length then the, of this whole program that generates that. But anyway, so, so this, is, this is fantastic. So that means we have, um, we have an induction, we can create an induction step based on this, that we are guaranteed that it gets as closer and closer to the real. Um, to the real distribution uh, uh, induction step. Can anybody see a problem with this? It's fantastic, but there's, but there's gotta be a but, right? Yeah. You can calculate this is perfect. Um, What's wrong with this formula? Remember what I said, this is, this is the sum across all the possible bit strings, across all the possible lengths of this bit string. And I told you that it's an infinite sum. And also from the definition of n, let's remind you of n, n being the sum of the programs such that universal tuning machines are x. What is the problem with this? So every possible one, what is that? Every possible combination of digits in that string? Not every possible combination. Well, yeah, this. Yeah. This, yes. So that's the name. All possible strings for one to zero. And these are all possible lengths of the string. So you start from a length one. And so this would be, uh, actually would just be zero or one. Okay? So, so this is the sum. So first you start with zero. This is a loop essentially, where x is first one and then zero, and then you do this. Then, then you increase this to two. Okay. And now, now you have the sum across all the strings of length two, and then this becomes three. So this is a nested loop essentially. Okay. But how does it converge quickly? What, what determines the number of steps? Well, you don't, you don't know that. All, all these proofs. Uh, so, uh, the proof is here. I don't know what it's less than, but uh, I mean, this one being much, one being much to you. K is the Kolmogor of complexity uh, of the original P1 to plus at some constant, which is, and this bit is less than infinity, which is, which is. So there are two parts uh, if you're subtracting the sum of squares. What's the difference between them? So this one would be your prediction if we knew with the real probability distribution. Okay? And this is what you want to get as close as possible. You, you know, you want to predict accurately, right? So if you could do if you knew this, you predict very accurately. Okay? And so this is instead, this is your this is our new induction um, strategy. Okay, to, to make good predictions, all right? And Solomon, all Solomon says, say, okay, yes, why is this a good way of doing induction? 
because I can prove that across these sums, this converges very quickly to the real to the real distribution. So this is an optimal way of doing induction stuff. But that so that means uh, if if I use this, okay, if, if if instead of mu now you put m m here, you whatever comes out is very close, if not exactly the real. What's the issue with this? Sorry? Was it included south of the program? <laughs> no. So, all the programs, <coughs> all the programs. Yes, so that's a factor. Yeah, so there could be infinite number of programs that solve the, the, um, the issue. What else? What else can you see from. So, I mean, if you think about any possible program that could output x, right? And, you know, you look at our, our programs, sometimes we, sometimes our, so one of our implementation is super quick, another one implementation, some of them So, I mean, presumably there are a lot of crap programs that can solve this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, so some, pro some program may take a hundred years to give you X. How much, how long do you wait? Okay, there are not infinite programs. You, are, you, you consider them all. It's, it's incomputable. You can't possibly look at all the possible models. Some models just will just never finish until the end of the universe. So you don't know, right? So it's incomputable. But there are approximations. People approximate these and there are papers and certain ways that they, that they do this. So it's beautiful, but it's incomputable. Um, it's probably the best solution, but unfortunately it's not computable. So you're only stuck with uh, an approximation. Because an approximation, you also don't know, okay, once you've decided, okay, I'll wait until, I'll wait three hours, you know, every time I run one of these models, I'll wait for three hours um, to stop. And then, you know, after those three hours, you've looked at a few of them, and then you decide, okay, this one is very good, but then, you know, how do you know if there isn't a, a better one afterwards that gives you, you know, it's just a little longer, but you haven't considered it. Anyway, because it's a little smaller, so it's uncomputable. You can't, you can only approximate this. Um, okay, so but then, if okay, even when we have an approximation, how do we use this? And then we come back to our base, essentially. Remember base? This idea that the um, um, the probability of your hypothesis, okay, um, 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 uh, fitting the data would be the data being generated by hypotheses, and remember the problematic prior that we had before, and then divided by the probability of the data being generated, and this was the problem, okay. So this is your this nice uh, induction step. This is a problem, and uh, thanks to uh, the work that Solomon did, you just um, use instead of you use as the prior the universal prior. Okay, universal prior being in this case t minus k. Yeah, so it, it's, this is the length of the program, or the length of the program that uh, realizes your hypothesis. Yeah. So your, your hypothesis could be something like uh, um, so your, your end hypothesis would be the function fn is the function that I'm looking for. So that could be uh, an interpretation of your hypothesis. Uh, and so if you if you use as the prior the um, the bound of the uh, um, uh, Solomonoff uh, universal prior, the, then you have a good chance with your approximation to get it very, very nice. So you'll see straight away that using this, the uh, uh, the hypothesis that will have greater probabilities are automatically the ones that are smaller. Uh, and so that's uh, it's probably the Hock and Waders and so on. That's a good thing. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, approximations of these are used. So someone 
Yeah, 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 that's a beauty. That's the beauty of it. It's fundamentally very simple, but but the way that you've done it, it's, it's really clever, and you really needed uh, ideas like the, the universal tree machine. Well, I mean, technically, like we explained before, you could have used A, you could have said in C, you could have all the programs in C that uh, the length of all the C programs that output that. You could have said that, but. Um, uh, the, but usually, when you do these proofs, you use a tree machine because it's uh, first of all it's the abstraction, and then you know that everything else, any other model of computation, is equivalent up to a constant. So if you can prove it on the universal tree machine, you're automatically proved it for any programming languages. Even even if we were talking about uh, um, people are doing computation with um, um, with uh, fungi or spores or anything, anything that does computation, because it's equivalent to a tree machine. Um, yeah, you can just prove it on a Turing machine to prove it from other tools or models. Um, yeah, so there are guys like um, uh, Ralph Kutter who's uh, developed uh, this idea of artificial general intelligence. This model is called IXI, I don't know how you say it, but he use, uses the evolution uh, of uh, the Q values that I'm using for the space invaders. Uh, which is uh, a reward-based uh, uh, model with the promoter of uh, um, that's our Solomon of uh, Universal Cryo to prove that the uh, uh, this this model is um, uh, it's an optimal um, artificial general intelligence. So this is an agent that can, in principle, in theory, solve any induction problem that are out there. Uh, again, it's incomputable because um, uh, at least it's nice to have to know theoretically that we have. An optimal artificial general intelligence. That's it. Right. I don't think there are any questions, are there? Right. Uh, what about concrete limitations? Because some of this stuff, um, I have a better education than some people here. Yeah. So I'm trying to get up. I've heard of Zeno. And most of this mass I could more or less follow. It wasn't too extreme. Um, but it still, um, it could often miss so, so what at the end of the day. Can you give us an example of how um, this sort of thing, you almost have to do, I think, with the Q-Learning average? Well, there, there are, so that's one example, but that's not very, I guess some, some people may have uh, tried um, um, practical version of IXE. Some people look better. It's just it's not very nice to compute. Um, but um, I think the one well, of well, the. I mean, Bayes' theorem has very straightforward practical examples. Yeah. Well, uh, Bayes' theorem is used all the time, and yeah. Bayesian analysis and uh, Bayesian decision tree, that's used all the time, yeah. But the, the contention is exactly uh, the, the contention is the prior. What do you use as a prior? Yes. So it's fine to it's fine to use a prior. So for example, to use a prior, if you had a, if you were thinking about um, predicting what the next uh, throw of data would be, okay. Uh, so your initial belief would be it's it's uh, it's a fair it's a fair die. So it's like one six, right? So that would be your prior. Okay, or well maybe you have some reason to believe that there is a bias for the three, someone put a weight in it, right? So, so that would be your knowledge, your belief, right? But there are some problems where you have to really have no freaking idea what the price, you know, like for something you never observed before, uh, something that has never happened before. What should the prior be? So that that's the main problem. And again, as I said, when you see, um, application of Bayes' theorem, a lot of the time, a lot of the paper would be justifying the prior, where the yeah. prior comes from. We've seen this sort of stuff, I suppose, with mathematical modeling, but um, financial trading systems and so on. Yeah. Uh, Bayes can get a kick in. I think this guy is one of the guys that uh, came closely to have, you can see a paper and there's a decent, real implementation, uh, approximation of, uh, application of uh, Solomonoff, uh, um, the university prior to do something. Um, Guys are a bit nuts, so it's not very easy to follow, but that's that's um, 
that's one example there. There are many, many other examples, and there are uh, now um, there are a lot of companies where the, their starting point is Solomonov and uh, and and I I see. So um, as opposed to just deep learning or normal artificial intelligence, uh, uh, general artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence is now becoming really big. Again, artificial general intelligence is an agent, is you know, uh, developing an agent that can, in principle, solve any induction problem now. It's thrown at it, so not just play well at chess, not just play well at Go, not just transform, uh, generate you know, bedrooms, but anything like humans. So that's a, that's a big field there, and, and most of them are, are starting from Solomonov, because it's got this beautiful idea of one algorithm is a I guess, yeah. Yeah. I think we we're more yeah, we we're, we're more in we're more like uh, um, yeah, a combination of specifically this reward, we figure out the reward that we get trying to check. Right, some of us die, some of us don't. But would, would um, you say there was something when you consider um, Dan Bennett's experiment with the robot with the battery, <coughs> uh, battery power? But what we do is um, uh, we have a very finite time in which we must come up with any decision. Yeah. And that makes us make wild hypotheses. So it doesn't matter to us what the probability of the hypothesis being any good. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, most of, the time, most of the time, we don't, and, and his presentation is perfect, most of the time we don't calculate probabilities like this. Yes. I mean, if we internally if we internally were able to do um, banks, we'd be much better in our finances, mm -hmm. in our decision making, in picking employees. <laughs> but we don't, and that's, uh, yeah. that's the core of this presentation. Yeah.